Are you nervous about getting a vaccine while pregnant? The good news is, is that you're not the only one. Even I was hesitant. Someone with a degree in the science field was hesitant about the idea of getting a vaccine while pregnant. That is, until I sifted through the data myself. And here's what I found. Welcome to the DeConta channel, where we discuss all things educational and we never duck away from difficult topics, including vaccines during pregnancy. As a mom, the only thing we ever want for our children is what is best for them. So naturally it's concerning if we don't know if a vaccine is actually what's best for them. And when it comes to vaccines during pregnancy, it's likely that your OB is going to recommend that you get two specific ones. The first one's going to be the flu shot, and the second one would be for whooping cough or pertussis, also known as DTaP. These are also two vaccines that the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, recommends that you get during pregnancy too. But why? Why is it that the CDC and your OB is pushing for you to get a flu shot and a DTaP shot while you're pregnant? To answer that question, the first thing we need to know is how a virus infects a human being. Then we'll need to discuss how a vaccine works in contrast to that. And finally, what the difference is between some various kinds of vaccines that you may have heard of. Viruses are basically microscopic protein balloons filled with their own DNA or RNA i.e. the genetic material used to create more baby viruses, if you will. The problem for the virus is that unlike you and me, who are multicellular beings with very complex cells that can copy themselves, is that the virus can't do that. It can't copy itself and that's where you and I come into play. The virus's sole purpose in life is to make more of itself by hijacking our complex multicellular system and tricking it into making those copies for it. It does this by injecting its own DNA or RNA directly into your cells. The bad news is, is that your cells don't initially see the virus's genetic material as a threat. So being the kind little helpers that they are, they incorporate the virus's genetic material into your DNA. And once that happens, your cells will start making copies of the virus's genetic material for it. After your cell makes many, many copies, eventually there are so many much virus genetic material shoved inside your cell that it can't contain it anymore and it explodes. Your cells exploding essentially releases all of the baby viruses all throughout the rest of your body so that they can now infect the rest of your cells. And it's usually around this point when you start to feel like crap because your immune system finally wakes up and goes, oh wait a second, that doesn't belong here, we should probably fight back. After days or sometimes even weeks of feeling like crap, as your body literally went to war with the virus army it created, you'll finally be back to normal. Now, in order to prevent you from experiencing this same attack from the same attacker again, your body makes a very special cell called a memory B cell. This singular immune cell contains all of the knowledge of how to fight that virus. So essentially, if you were to get infected with that same virus strand again, your body would be able to kick its butt right from the get-go instead of letting it take over your entire cellular function and invade you and make you feel like crap for a few weeks. The unfortunate part here is that the virus is smart, if you could give it some kind of intelligence label here. It's smart in that it alters its genetic material ever so slightly every single year. And because of that, the Trojan horse may look like a Trojan duck to your immune system next year. So then if that happens and you happen to get infected with the Trojan duck, which again is just a slightly altered version of the Trojan horse you were already infected with, then you're gonna have to go through the whole feel like crap cycle all over again to create a new memory B cell in order to fight the Trojan duck. Now onto how the vaccine itself works. A vaccine sort of takes the place of a virus infecting you, but it does so in a much more controlled manner. This way you can create a memory B cell without the full fledged feeling like crap conundrum of being infected with the actual virus. Unlike the actual virus, the DNA and RNA within a vaccine has been 
altered or chopped up into tiny bits, typically. These little pieces or these little bits and pieces of the viral genetic information within a vaccine are easier for your body to identify and manage and learn how to fight against than fighting against the entire full-fledged army of a complete genetic information setup. In other words, instead of throwing our immune systems into the water and yelling at it to swim, dang it! We're giving it a chance to wear floaties and teach it how to swim first before throwing it into the deep end with the sharks. Then, if we happen to encounter the real virus at that point, then our body should recognize it and sound the red alarm. Instead of allowing the virus to trick our cells and force our cells to make copies of it, and invade us. Now it's important to keep in mind here that it takes about two weeks for your body to create antibodies and also to make that memory B cell after getting vaccinated. So within those first two weeks while your immune system is still learning how to swim after being vaccinated, you could still get Trojan horsed. So be careful if you happen to be hanging around sick people and thinking you are a-okay. Not quite in those first two weeks. Now let's consider this information in the context of pregnancy. Your little one, busily growing inside of you, gains his or her immune system through your immune system's knowledge. So if you create antibodies and a memory B cell with the knowledge of how to fight off a certain virus while you're pregnant, chances are that you'll pass on that same memory or antibodies or immune system knowledge to your baby once they're born. It's like a two for one deal. It's awesome. BOGO. Buy one, get one. And now this is the reason why your OB and the CDC strongly recommends that you get the flu shot and your Ddap shot while pregnant. Since roughly seven in 10 deaths occur in babies less than two months old from the whooping cough, these are babies who are far too young quite yet to be vaccinated on their own with the DDAP shot. And since the whooping cough, contrary to its name, might not even make your baby cough, in fact, it could just have them stop breathing altogether, yikes, it is super important that you get your DTAP shot while you're pregnant between weeks 27 and 36. It might literally be your baby's only defense against the whooping cough. Getting the flu shot while you're pregnant also has the chance of passing on that immunity to your little one after they're born and keeping them from getting horribly ill. It also has the bonus effect of keeping you from getting horribly ill as the pregnant mama, especially since your immune system, heart, and other bodily functions like your lungs aren't really at their prime right now while you're pregnant. Now, you may have heard a great deal of controversy surrounding the flu shot in general, especially while pregnant, so you might be a little bit hesitant about the idea of getting it. But instead of politics and vague opinions, here's what the science has to say about it. There have been many studies with years of collected data and constant monitoring of the flu vaccine safety during pregnancy through a system called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which is just an early warning system that the FDA and the CDC uses to monitor the progress after vaccinations occur and to help them keep track of any health concerns following. Between both of these huge arsenals of information, it has been shown time and time again that the flu shot has no adverse reaction to you, your pregnancy, or your child. But the claims for negative effects on your unborn child did cause the vaccine industry to create one especially made for pregnant women. That is, a flu shot without preservatives. So even if the claims of the flu shot causing autism were to be true, you can now get the flu shot as a pregnant woman without the preservatives in it, thereby eliminating any negative claim that the anti-flu shot side may have had against it, and hopefully set your mind at ease about getting it. There are many types of vaccines. Some use different pieces of the virus, like its proteins, sugars, or capsid. That's the strategy of the DTaP vaccine, by the way. While others use a toxin made by the germ that causes the disease state in the first place, which is the case for the tetanus vaccine, for example. But the two types of vaccines that are of the main concern for pregnant individuals are the attenuated live vaccine category, 
and the inactivated vaccine category. The attenuated live viruses are essentially just that, a weakened form of the live virus with a nearly complete but slightly altered instruction manual, or genetic set. Altering its genetic information makes it so that it can't infect you as fast. It's kind of like breaking the virus's legs and telling it to chase you. It's still gonna chase you, but more like a zombie crawl after you, so it'll be slowed down and give your immune system enough time to gather resources and fight back. The MMR vaccine that your pediatrician will recommend for your baby after they're born to prevent measles, mumps, and rubella is a perfect example of an attenuated live vaccine. Now, these specific types of vaccines are not recommended during pregnancy because they do have the potential of harming your baby, while you're pregnant. However, the inactivated category of vaccines are the same kind as I mentioned before, the ones where the genetic information is chopped up into tiny bits or altered, which is essentially killing the virus and injecting you with its dead parts. Although the jury is still out here as to whether or not a virus is actually alive or not. And now these are the types of vaccines that are recommended for you during pregnancy. Since you're not getting a weakened live form of the vaccine, like you would be with a live attenuated vaccine category. And now here, the flu shot is a great example of an inactivated vaccine, the one that's safe during pregnancy. So hopefully after this information, you might be a little bit more comfortable with the idea of getting a flu shot or a DDAP shot, but the burning question that you likely still have is, what about the COVID shot? Between employers requiring their employees to get the COVID shot and all of the politics that surround the COVID vaccine itself over the past couple of years, you might be feeling really uncertain as to whether or not you should get the COVID vaccine, especially while you're pregnant. And I totally get it, by the way. I felt the same way. And that's the reason why I decided to get the COVID vaccine before I got pregnant, so I wouldn't even have to face that decision. As a side note here, if you haven't gotten the COVID vaccine because you're concerned about the potential fertility issues, I can tell you from my own personal experience that after receiving my second Pfizer shot, I was able to still get pregnant with this little girl one and a half months later, so it certainly did not affect my fertility. And I don't see a scientific reason why it would affect yours either. But what if you're already pregnant and your OB or your boss is pressuring you into getting the COVID vaccine or even just the booster if you had the vaccine prior to becoming pregnant? Well, I, I can't make that decision for you, but what I can do to help you is present you with the scientific rationale as to how the COVID vaccine works in your body. This particular vaccine is revolutionary and the first of its kind because unlike the flu shot where you're injected with little bits and pieces of inactivated virus, and unlike the MMR shot, which is the live attenuated virus, the weakened form of the live virus, this vaccine injects you with the genetic instructions in the form of mRNA or messenger RNA in order to create a special protein called a spike protein that's found on the exterior of the COVID virus itself. But keep in mind, this spike protein is not the COVID virus. You can kind of think of it like the mole on your face. It's an identifying feature of you, but the mole is not intrinsically you. So after getting the COVID vaccine, your cells will make this spike protein and present them on the exterior of their surface. In other words, they're making the mole that would be on the COVID virus's face in order for your immune system to recognize it and say, aha, that doesn't belong here, I need to fight back. Of course, this triggers your immune system to make antibodies and that memory B cell we talked about earlier in order for you to learn or teach your immune system how to swim and fight back against the real deal. Now here's the really important part about the COVID vaccine itself. After your body has made the spike protein part of the COVID virus and displays it on its own cell's surface, your cells will break down that mRNA, the messenger RNA, instruction setup used to make the protein and remove it from your cells entirely. Thus, the COVID mRNA never even had the chance to enter your DNA 
therefore it doesn't incorporate or alter your DNA in any way, shape, or form, and would also not alter the DNA of your little one. Now, I can't say the same for the actual live COVID virus if you were to come down or get infected with COVID. From there, the decision is ultimately yours as to whether or not you feel comfortable getting the COVID vaccine while pregnant. Biochemically speaking, there shouldn't be any reason for your little one to get harmed from the COVID vaccine, which again is not what I can say about the actual live COVID virus itself. Even though there isn't a lot of specific COVID vaccine during pregnancy data collected yet in order to ensure its complete safety without any kind of doubt whatsoever, from a scientific standpoint of how this vaccine works in your body, there really shouldn't be any cause for fear that it would harm your little one. But there is a huge cause for fear of getting the live COVID virus while pregnant. According to my husband, who is a pharmacist that works at the Naval Hospital here in Virginia, the pregnant women he has all seen hospitalized due to being infected with COVID were all unvaccinated. And they've all so far ended up being intubated for weeks on a long laundry list of medications to keep both them and their unborn child alive. So personally speaking here, it really all comes down to weighing your odds. Is it worth risking getting the live COVID virus and potentially having your DNA and your baby's DNA altered from it? Or is it more worth getting the COVID vaccine during pregnancy and teaching your immune system how to identify the mole on the face of the live COVID virus to teach it how to fight back? even if there isn't a ton of pregnancy-related COVID vaccine data available yet. And no one should ever force you to take the vaccine. That decision is entirely up to you, but at least you now have the information and the facts to be able to make a decision one way or the other. So what has week 27, the first week of the third trimester of pregnancy, felt like? Bring on the acid reflux, baby. Not even Tums seem to be enough to help keep this acid reflux in check lately. I've been feeling a lot of movements, which is wonderful. And you can see the, uh, the kicks and the punches from the outside of my belly now. You can see her moving across my, uh, my belly. And it's kind of like a double-edged sword because feeling her move relieves my anxiety. But at the same time, if I not feeling her move for any prolonged period of time that amps up my anxiety to wonder if she's okay in there. Since I delivered early in my first pregnancy, I'm also frequently finding myself worrying about preterm labor and getting all my ducks in a row, if you will, for if that happens and feeling like I'm a human ticking time bomb that could give birth at any minute now. It's like my entire life has boiled down to worrying about everything all the time. But the chiropractor has been my absolute saving grace this week. I go once a week now to the chiropractor and it definitely has helped me be able to walk and limited my back, neck, and upper shoulder pain. My dreams have also been absolutely surreal this week. And I mean, I'm talking like I've, I've never personally been high ever in my life, but I can imagine that these dreams are what high would feel like <laughs> if I had ever been. For example, one of the dreams I had uh, this last week was that I gave birth to this purple Mulan Mushu type dragon. And I was then asked to breastfeed said purple dragon, who was by the way, wearing a vest. <laughs> and nobody thought this was odd. Um, and I had to breastfeed said purple dragon in front of all of my male relatives who were standing around me and staring at me. Very awkward, very weird dream that I remember in vast detail and also remember just feeling so weird that nobody else thought it was weird that I gave birth to a purple dragon. <laughs> Unfortunately, not all of my dreams have been hilariously weird like that, and some of them have been sheer terror uh, one of them was me waking up in my dream to being covered in blood and of course running to the hospital covered in blood. So unfortunately, not all of them are uh, very happy. A lot of them are quite horrifying and I still unfortunately remember them, every single one of them. And on to what our little one looks like this week. Our baby is about, if we were low-balling this value here, 
13.75 inches or 35 centimeters long, which is roughly equivalent to a head of broccoli or a cabbage or a cauliflower as seen in the model here. Baby should be weighing in at just slightly over two pounds now, so around two and a quarter or roughly one kilogram. Our little one should be able to open and close their eyes now at this point and they have their own sleep and wake cycle, which is great news unless their sleep and wake cycle happens to uh, be contrary to yours, <laughs> in which case they're probably keeping you awake through the night by their kicks and punches. And their brain is rapidly growing at this point, creating millions of neurons and connections between them in order to help them control all of those little movements once they exit the womb into the big world. Baby can definitely hear your voice now, so be sure that you talk to them, sing to them, tell them what's going on in the outside world so that they can be familiar with your voice. And if you happen to be feeling rhythmic movements in your uterus, no fear. It's likely that your little one is just hiccuping. As his or her lungs continue to develop, it's pretty normal to experience these very funny feeling hiccups at least a few times. All of the different types of vaccines have the potential to make us superhuman with the ability to defend against most invasions. And these superhuman powers can be passed on to our little ones inside the womb. But I'd personally like to know how you feel about getting the COVID vaccine while pregnant. Tell me all about it in the comments below. These videos take quite a bit of time to make, but it only costs you a second to like this one. To join me next week in this 40 week pregnancy series or the super simplified science of pregnancy, all you have to do is subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again next week.